This is a response to Thrand and talking about my girth. So looking at the girth of my weapon here, this is a pretty big spearhead and as Thran pointed out, I made a video previously, I'll put a link below and I'll also put a link to his video. Um, and his video is really good by the way, I recommend you go and watch it. Because um, he has lots of good, fun stabbing of uh, test targets in his backyard. I'd love to come and visit actually, uh, if I'm ever in uh, Thran's area, I'd love to come and visit and uh, do some of that. Um, and I extend the, the welcome, the invitation to if, if he's over this direction at some point. But um, I made a video some time ago making one point really, um, and that's about the size of some weapons and saying that sometimes weapons are excessively big. Um, and that sometimes it might just be for, you know, bravado, showing off, intimidation, status, whatever. And I do stand by that point. Um, I do think that some weapons are deliberately made big because weapons aren't only functional. And I think this is the main point I was trying to make, was that um, sometimes, you know, weapons are connected with lots of other things in culture, rather than just a mechanical cause and effect. Um, so very often, um, you know, if we look at, for example, Anglo-Saxon weapons, if you look at the Sutton Hoo um, weapon assemblage, arms and armour assemblage, for example, and well, not just arms and armour, in fact, there's a whole bunch of things from Sutton Hoo that were found. I've talked with Paul Mortimer in the past uh, on previous videos here. If you search Sutton Hoo or Anglo-Saxon in my videos, you'll find those videos. And um, very clearly, there are aspects of the design of those weapons, for example, the amount of garnet and gold and decoration on them, that are to do with status, they're to do with conveying an idea um, and I think that sometimes the size and shape of weapons can also be involved with that and I use this Sudanese spearhead as an example of that but what Thran absolutely correctly points out is there can also be a physical reason for having a very large spearhead and we're just going to talk about spears here I've got a few spears here to talk about um, in fact, uh, two of, uh, well, at least one of these others is another Sudanese spear, but is very different to this one. So this is a particularly large type, and this type of spear, which often incidentally had a, um, essentially a pommel at the back end, a counterweight at the back end, this example doesn't, but I suspect that this is not the original shaft of this one, so we'll ignore the shaft now. Uh, but some of these very big headed Sudanese spears did have a back weight on the back end, presumably so that if you were using it, whether you were using it two-handed or if you were using it one-handed with a shield, you could hold it and use it more nimbly whilst uh, holding your shield out and hold the weapon further back and therefore get longer reach. Now, even though this is very big, it's actually really quite thin and quite flat. So I can actually quite easily um, use this spear one-handed, holding it that far back. How much reach is that? Let's see, it's about four foot, four foot long, I would guess. Um, so I've got quite a serious amount of reach with that already. And if I was using a, um, using a shield, I could quite you know, nimbly thrust in you know, high, low, left, right with that, with really, really good reach. Um, even though it's quite big because it's thin. And absolutely, I completely agree with Thrand, and his demonstrations perfectly show this, that a large spearhead means, obviously, a larger hole in the opponent. And that also means you reduce the risk of over-penetration. Now, I always talk about the fact that I love deep penetration, but I also point out that what you don't want to do is over-penetrate. You don't want to go deeper than is useful. Once you've gone through someone's body, Thrusting your weapon even further through them doesn't do you any good whatsoever and in fact it's detrimental to what you want because it brings you closer to your opponent and puts you in greater risk of them hitting you back. And you know Thran talks about examples from um, the sagas, from the, um, from the Norse sagas and Icelandic sagas talking about people running up spear shafts after having been impaled. Well I've given examples in fact of this happening with spears and bayonets and even swords. Um, in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, even in the 20th century in the trenches uh, of uh, northern France and Belgium it happened, um, where over penetration meant that your opponent could stab you or cut you back, which clearly you don't want. So if you have a large spearhead, number one, absolutely it makes a bigger hole, which is hopefully going to mean that the opponent who's also trying to kill you is put out of action quicker. It has a greater chance of severing things like tendons and muscle um, and perforating lungs more seriously 
um, bigger chance of hitting internal organs, hearts and things that are going to make someone drop out of action more quickly. Um, or indeed, if you hit them in the face, a greater chance of injuring their eyes, their windpipe, all of this kind of stuff. So a bigger head is more likely to do more damage. And as Thran points out, it's more likely to increase blood, blood loss, um, which equally for hunting purposes, whether you're fighting or hunting, it's the same thing. You're trying to put a living creature out of action as quickly as possible. So absolutely, having a large head can serve that purpose on a spear. Um, just to show a couple of different examples, um, this, I have shown this before, um, I actually don't know which part of Africa this is from, but it's definitely African. You can see by the incredible thinness of that shaft, this is almost certainly for throwing. And interestingly, if we look at the balance point, and this is the original shaft because of the way it's fitted into the socket, I can see that that's never been out of there. And the balance point, incredibly, is there. Okay, so really the shaft of this is, you could almost say, is not really for holding. The shaft of this one is really just to give um, stability in flight, I would say, and probably, you're probably going to throw it from holding it about that point uh, with a shield, and you might have several of these, and you're a little bit like a pilum or plumbata, something like that. You're just going to lob these things as, as far as you can, and then you're probably going to go to one of these, and this is Sudanese, and it does have the weight, I'll bring it up for camera there so you can see, it does have a coiled piece of iron and that's typically Sudanese feature. It's something we find in um, that part of North Africa. Um, and that does mean that you can hold the weapon comfortably pretty much right at the back here. It's a pommel essentially. So it gives the point of balance of this spear somewhat similar to a longsword. Okay, so it now means that if I was using a shield, or not even, even if I'm not using a shield, it means that I can use this spear very nimbly, almost like a, like a rapier actually, um, giving me an incredibly long reach, as you can see, see there, about equivalent to a rapier blade or a longsword blade. Um, so this thing is very nimble and can be used from an extreme range, but of course the big advantage this has over a sword is the technology that you need and the iron that you need to make it far, far less because you only need to be able to make a small spearhead. You don't have to worry about heat treatment or um, the quality of the steel really even. Um, and then a little bit of iron at the back to balance it. So this is actually like a kind of, essentially a poor man's sword, isn't it, in a way. But this worked for the Zulus. The, uh, a weapon similar to this, this is a bit longer, but the, um, the Zulu um, Iklwa, which is sometimes known as the Asagai, I believe the Asagai is actually their throwing spear, more similar to one of these, um, but the Ikwa um, is a similar weapon to this. Um, this was used in Sudan and Ethiopia and these sort of areas, um, and used usually with a large shield, and very, very effective either underhand or, of course, could be used overhand as well. Um, and could a push could be thrown at close range, but it's not gonna go as far as one of the lighter weapons. But quite noticeably, these have got a smaller head on them, so they are gonna penetrate with less force um, or rather, to explain that in a different way, with le less force required, they will penetrate more easily because they've got a narrower head. But that does mean you have a greater risk of over-penetration. Now, in reality, it's still a relatively broad head. Um, so I don't think you have to worry too much about this um, going too far into the target. Having stabbed various things with various uh, weapons throughout my life, um, I, I would guess that an average stab will probably penetrate about that deeply um, with this spear, which is more than enough to put an opponent out of action. It's as deep as their torso. But going back to the large spearhead, really just to sum up, I essentially completely agree with Thrand. Um, large spearheads do serve a purpose. Yes, absolutely, they make a bigger hole and increase the uh, damage you're likely to do, do to the target. They increase the amount of blood loss that the target's going to suffer. Um, and importantly, and perhaps even more importantly in a way, they prevent over-penetration, which is a problem with thrusting weapons. Um, but also to say that I don't go back on uh, my previous point that sometimes very large weapons or peculiarly shaped weapons don't it doesn't always come down to um cause and effect in terms of you know physical characteristics and um 
necessarily how that weapon um, functions in, in battle. Um, sometimes weapons were designed a particular way for other reasons and sometimes status did play a part in that. Um, so whilst I think that we can certainly say that Sudanese spears of this size and absolutely again I agree with Thrand that in, in the Sudan most people were not wearing armour. Some were incidentally, they did have uh, coats of mail and Kulakud uh, Persian style helmets, the uh, nobility used those, um, but most standard foot soldiers and most cavalry in the Sudan did not have any armour, in fact often fought with no very little clothes at all. Um, against those sort of targets and opponents, absolutely a large spearhead is going to do a lot of damage and is going to be very very effective. But at the same time you do lose some um, nimbleness and speed perhaps by having more metal in the head than you need. I just want to finish up by showing this spearhead that I've got here. Lovely, I haven't got around to mounting this yet. Uh, I actually use it as a paper knife, <laughs> uh, but it's made by Paul Bins. And um, you'll see it's very, very stiff and it's more like, this type of head is more like, uh, almost like a, a dagger blade really, but you would have it on the end of a stick. And absolutely, as Thran says, this is designed to puncture resistant materials such as padded armour, perhaps leather, thick clothing, woolen clothing, and of course, male armour. So yes, the context of where these weapons were used, uh, and who by, and who against, plays a big part as well. Um, but yeah, so to sum up, I completely agree with everything Thran says, I would only add the caveat, sometimes weapons are big because someone's showing off. Cheers folks. God, how much reach is that? Uh, it's just... Where these spears were used plays a big part as, part as well. Cheers, folks. Ah! Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Follow us on Facebook. You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt. Support us on Patreon. Or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.